started. My name's Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at WSU. And on behalf of the Institute and on behalf of our co-sponsor, the Edward R. Murrow College of Communications, I want to invite, uh, uh, welcome you out to our event, uh, our panel discussion on micro-targeting today. Before I introduce our panelists and the panel topic, a couple of quick announcements. If you're here for a class, there will be sign-in sheet, sign sheets at the end of the event only, so, and it will be over by 6 o'clock. Um, also, I, I wanted to remind folks that our next Foley event is uh, next Tuesday at 4.30 in Q203. We have a discussion between Bob Anglis and Brian Baird, two former members of Congress, a, a Democrat and a Republican, both of whom have served on the, on the uh, uh, Science and Technology Committee. They're going to be talking about bipartisan approaches and solutions to climate change. Should be a really interesting discussion. I encourage you to come to that. Tonight, uh, however, we have a very interesting panel discussion. Uh, there's an old saying in advertising that if you're not paying for the service, then you are the product. And that's probably never been more true than in today's de digital age. Companies like Google and Facebook are gathering massive amounts of data about our online activities, from our browsing habits, email activities, the videos we view, the places we visit, our social media likes and dislikes, our personal and political interests. Meanwhile, political parties are building large databases of demographic information and personal information about our party affiliations, our frequency of voting, our contributions, our volunteerism, our particular policy concerns and ideological attitudes and other information from both public and private databases. All of this is then used by campaigns that target us with individualized messaging calculated to appeal to our specific individual identities, interests, and predispositions. Sometimes the gathering and use of this information takes place with our consent, but often it does not. For example, just a few weeks ago, Facebook reported a data breach that jeopardized the personal information of some 50 million of its users. What should we make of this new practice of gathering massive amounts of our personal information into databases that can be used to weaponize ad technology? What are the privacy concerns? What are the political concerns? Fortunately, we have with us today a really fantastic panel of experts who can shed some light on these questions. I'm going to introduce each of our panelists, uh, and then I've asked each of them to take about 10 minutes for some preliminary remarks, uh, after which we'll open it up for some uh, discussion and some uh, Q&A. Our first uh, panelist today is going to be Travis Riddout, who's my colleague uh, in the Department of uh, Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs here at WSU, and is also the Thomas S. Foley Distinguished Professor of Government. He is the uh, co-director of the Wellesleyan Media Project, which tracks political advertising. His research on political campaigns and political advertising has appeared in many journals. And his most recent book, Political Advertising in the United States, was just recently published by Taylor and Francis in 2016. Our uh, panelist uh, after Travis will be Shannon McGregor, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Communications at the University of Utah. Her research interests center on political communication, social media, gender, and public opinion. And she uses methods like surveys, experiments, and large-scale com computational and network analyses in order to understand political events in socially networked digital spaces. Her net work has been published widely in scholarly journals of communication, media, and political science. And then finally, our uh, third panelist will be Emily Stewart. Emily is a writer and reporter currently working for Vox, which is one of the leading online news and opinion websites. Emily has reported extensively about political micro-targeting, and in addition to Vox, her reporting has appeared in CNBC, Yahoo, Yahoo Finance, The Street, and the San Francisco Chronicle, among other places. So join me now in welcoming our panelists. And I'll turn the microphone over to Travis. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for having me here today. I get to start things off with kind of the broad overview of micro-targeting in political campaigns. And uh, let's say you're surfing the internet one day, and you come across this ad. It's from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York. 
And after telling you that she basically wants to decriminalize marijuana, she wants your opinion on that issue. So should we decriminalize marijuana? Now let's say you say yes. So you click on the button and it takes you to the, this website um, where you are able to enter in your email address, your first name, last name, and your zip code. Okay, so I hit yes again, vote now, and well now I get to go to the survey that asks me a bunch of loaded and biased questions such as how important is, is it to you to support strong progressives who will demand change and hold the Trump administration accountable? Um, oh, by the way, the last question, of course, asks you if you will donate to Senator Gillibrand. Needless to say, it's kind of an odd survey. Um, first of all, why is a senator from New York running ads in Washington State? Uh, second, why do these questions seem designed to influence my opinion more than measure my opinion? Um, and the only way this makes sense to me is if the senator is maybe thinking about running for some national political office in 2020. So, so about two hours ago, I, I was online following the news and Senator Gillibrand said she's definitely not running for president in 2020. Still, I'm, I don't know if I completely believe her, given um, you know, the effort she has been, has been taking to get her name out there on digital media on a national scale. Anyway, um, the point of introducing this talk this way is to show you this is really uh, the first step in one way in which campaigns micro-target voters. It's gathering that information about those voters. And so what do, what do we mean by micro-targeting? A very simple definition is that it is sending specific messages to specific voters or types of voters based on their characteristics. That means the campaign has to know something about you before sending that message to you and to base that decision to send the message to you based on what it does know about you. And in, in one sense, a variation of micro-targeting has been around for a long time. Political candidates have been knocking on doors at, on people's homes for, for decades, if not centuries now, and basing the decision on whether to knock on your door or not on whether you voted in the past election or not, whether you're a registered Republican or a registered Democrat or an independent. But modern day micro-targeting has really taken off as people have adopted uh, email and have adopted social media. If you think about um, watching an ad that's aired on broadcast TV, that ad kind of reaches everyone who's watching TV. It reaches people that the campaign doesn't really care to reach, people who are never going to vote, people who are assuredly going to vote for the other side. So the neat thing about micro-targeting is that you can reach only those people you want to reach. So how do campaigns decide who they want to reach? Well, oftentimes it relies upon an analysis of big data. Um, Senator Gillibrand's campaign, for instance, or more likely the micro-targeting firm that she employed, will take your name, email address, zip code, uh, will match it to the voter file in your state so they have additional information about your voter turnout, perhaps party registration, depending on the state in which you live. Um, and then they will purchase copious information from consumer data firms to attach on to that information. So they have these huge databases with lots of pieces of information about you. And yes, most of you in this room are included in those databases. And then the statisticians go to work. Uh, they try to predict your likelihood of turning out to vote, your likelihood of voting for a Democrat or for a Republican, or maybe the likelihood that you care about a particular issue. And so the fact that you subscribe to particular magazines or that you pay your bills on time or not, 
or that you um, own a certain type of car, that can be indicative of your political leanings. Um, maybe not the best indicator if, if we have your party registration status, but in the absence of that, this type of information can be very useful. And it can help them to tailor their messages as well. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Um, this is showing automobile ownership, uh, bipartisanship, and your likelihood to turn out to vote. So anyone own a Plymouth? <laughs> Any Plymouth owners? Uh, if you owned a Plymouth, we would predict you're, you're pretty democratic, but you're not very likely to turn out to vote. Um, if you own a hybrid or a Subaru, no surprise here, uh, you're probably a high turnout Democratic voter. Uh, anyone own a Porsche? No? Okay. Uh, high turnout Republican, uh, which maybe makes sense. It's the, the Toyota and Honda owners who everyone is competing over. Anyway, this is just one example of the type of information that might be contained within uh, these big files and that they can use in order to decide whether they want to contact you or not. So how do campaigns reach you through social media? Uh, one approach is providing a list of names and email addresses to the social media company. So they upload to Facebook, here's the list of email addresses we've collected. Um, try to find these people in your database and target them with these ads. Another method of doing this is seeking people whose characteristics are known by the social media platform. Uh, Facebook, for instance, knows a lot about you. Uh, you have provided Facebook a lot of information about yourself. And so this could be basic information about what zip code you live in, or your age, or your gender. But it could also be your particular interests. It could be whether you belong to particular groups or not. Now, Facebook has had to narrow down these categories somewhat uh, since last fall, when the investigative journalism website ProPublica showed how one could use Facebook to target ads to anti-Semites. So here's what they did. They, could, they found people whose field of study was Jew hater, or how to burn Jews, people who were employed by the Nazi party, and I want to send my ads to these people. And they were able to do it. Um, Facebook naturally faced some criticism over this, and they have you know, taken steps to try to prevent this from happening, but um, I think we, we continually hear of stories like this. Um, that's not the only public relations disaster that Facebook has faced. Um, in March of this year, the targeting firm Cambridge Analytica, uh, based in the UK, employed by Donald Trump's presidential campaign in 2016, was revealed to have harvested the Facebook profiles of 50 million users. Uh, Facebook says, well, Cambridge Analytica didn't abide by our terms, but still they faced intense criticism from, from us, from members of Congress, over how they could have allowed this to happen. And then, they, then Cambridge Analytica developed algorithms that could psychologically profile those individuals based on those Facebook profiles. And this affected their targeting decisions and how they tailored particular ads to particular individuals. So how, how prevalent is this micro-targeting? I think one way to assess this is to examine digital spending in election campaigns. Um, I'm co-director of the Wesleyan Media Project, which has tracked political advertising since 2010. And we've started tracking spending on digital advertising in 2018. And since May 31st of this year, the candidates running for US Senate have spent $17.5 million just on Facebook and Google ad networks. Uh, gubernatorial candidates have spent $5.3 million. Um, 
who are the biggest candidate spenders, two people you may have heard of before. Uh, President Donald Trump, uh, he's not up for re-election until 2020. He's already spent about $6 million on those two platforms this year uh, running ads. Um, second guy is a, a wannabe senator from Texas by the last name of O'Rourke, who has spent $5.6 million on those two platforms. Um, most Senate candidates this year have been spending, on average, about 10% of their campaign dollars on digital. For O'Rourke, it's more like 30%. And Facebook itself reports that 256 million has been spent on their platform on electioneering and issue advocacy since May of this year. That's a quarter of a billion dollars, folks. That's a lot of money. And so digital advertising is not going away. Uh, it's here to stay and almost certainly will be more important to campaigns as we head into the future. And so the task for us now is to figure out how to handle the challenges that will come with this. Um, these challenges include protecting the privacy of social media users, preventing the unauthorized release of data, ensuring transparency on the part of advertisers, on the part of the social media platforms themselves. And so I hope these are, are some of the issues that we will take up uh, as we continue our discussion today. Thank you. I'll hang this somewhere on my, on all my accoutrements here. All right, good evening. Um, thank you all so much for having me here. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about micro-targeting from the perspective of the relationship between these technology firms like Facebook and Google and Twitter and political campaigns. Like what does this actually look like when these folks are working together um, around these millions and millions of dollars like Travis just spoke about. Um, so as Cornell mentioned at the beginning, Every action and action that we take across these different platforms um, is saved, right? And, and these are the types of data that is used to be able to target us for um, political campaigns or even just issue advocacy around certain things. Um, and so uh, what I have done um, in my own research is looked at what this relationship looks like around politics. Um, and so one of the things that um, I found out was in talking to people at these tech firms who work on political teams and in talking to a bunch of folks who worked on 2016 presidential campaigns, um, is that technology firms have sort of, in the political sphere, built themselves to look like politics. Um, so what do I mean? Uh, this means that if you work at Google and you're gonna work in the Google politics sphere, you are gonna be sorted into either, if you're a Republican, then you're gonna work with Republican candidates and you're gonna work with uh, conservative issue groups or super PACs and they're gonna likewise sort the, uh, from the much larger pile of Democrats working at Google um, to work with Democratic campaigns and to work with more liberal um, issue advocacy groups or super PACs. So while we think of these organizations as, as nonpartisan and, um, and they try and convince us, you know, when they have to go speak on Capitol Hill that they're nonpartisan, they sort themselves into these sort of partisan groups when they're gonna work in political spaces. And this makes sense. Most of the political world is like this, right? The digital consultancies that Travis spoke about, um, it's not as if a digital consultancy run by a bunch of Republicans is gonna work for a Beto O'Rourke campaign in Texas. But it's quite interesting to see these technology firms sort of adapting to the political world and actually having these different um, partisan groups in them as well. Um, and so these groups of Republican and Democratic staffers at firms like Google and Facebook and Twitter work with political campaigns on their side of the aisle around these types of micro-targeted ad buys. Um, but what I found out uh, in my research with my colleague Daniel Kreese at, at UNC is that they do a lot more than that. So uh, when we were interviewing these folks who worked on 2016 presidential campaigns and interviewing people who worked at firms like Facebook and Google and Twitter, um, we found that they're of course advertised, they're helping facilitate ad buys, right? To try and get uh, this number that's already quite huge to get bigger. Um, but of course, even this very large number that you mentioned, this is not a huge number when we look at the overall 
uh, sort of advertising revenue that a company like Facebook or Google brings in. Um, so why else are they doing this? Why would these technology firms want to get in bed with politics at all, given the fact, especially after 2016, when we've seen everything that's happened with Cambridge Analytica, and they've sort of been called before you know, the Senate and congressional floor to answer for this. Um, so in talking to them, we found out that they also want to do it for a couple other reasons. Um, one of them is, of course, the money, um, which is a small amount compared to their overall revenue, but it's not exactly a drop in the bucket when we're approaching a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, but they also want to do it to try and market these certain different products that they have on their websites to a larger and more politically motivated audience. Um, will come as no surprise to y'all in this room that, of course, things like presidential elections and even Senate and gubernatorial elections get a lot of media attention, not just on social media, but in other media as well. And so if firms like Facebook and Google can be involved in politics and get added visibility, right, every time Trump tweeted, or every time he tweets now, it doesn't just live on Twitter, right? It goes on CNN, it's on Fox News, it's on the New York Times website. So this gets added exposure for these uh, technology companies. Um, one example of this from the 2016 campaign is Facebook Live had been out already, but as the campaign was ramping up, the folks at Facebook said, hey, like we can really tap into getting some of these candidates to use Facebook Live to try and get more people on board with this additional product that we want people to be engaged with. And so the consultants that I talked to who worked on the presidential campaigns said that the people at Facebook they were working with were like really pushing them to use Facebook Live and offering them incentives to um, help support them if they had questions about how it works so that you know, their candidates would really be using this new product and give it some added visibility and credibility uh, around those things as well. Um, and so these, these staffers at firms like Facebook and, and Google and Twitter are not just facilitating with ad buys, they're doing a lot more um, is, is what I found out. Um, so they're basically acting as like de facto digital consultants to these campaigns um, for free, ostensibly, it's sort of an in-kind donation. Um, and so this is everything like taking some of the mountains of data that they have about all of us to advising candidates on um, not even ad buys, but just more organic posts. Um, so uh, a woman who works uh, with the Republican candidates uh, at Google during the 2016 campaign told me that, like, for example, they noticed that a lot of people were Googling how tall Jeb Bush was. And so they told the Bush campaign this. And so the Bush campaign came up with this um, sort of image that they were circulating that had Jeb Bush in relation to Donald Trump and like football players and basketball players. Um, really elevating the level of our political discussion. But this was not an ad buy on Google. This was a, a sort of free information that they were getting to just consult with them generally around, hey, we have this data and we're thinking that this might be something that would be helpful to you. Um, it also looked like um, Google flying members are offering to fly members from different campaigns out to their Mountain View campus uh, for ideation sessions. Um, during the 2016 primary, the only campaign that took them up on that was the Rand Paul campaign. Um, so folks from the Rand Paul campaign flew out to Google. They had an ideation session. I'm not really sure what that means either. Um, but they sat around a room. And what they came up with was, if anybody remembers this from eons ago, it seems like now, Rand Paul's 24-hour live stream of his like day on the campaign. Um, so maybe this wasn't the most successful ideation or consulting session ever. But nonetheless, this was a day that Rand Paul um, staffers sat in a room with folks who work at Google and thought about, based on all this data that we have about you and about the people that are searching for you and the people that might be interested in you, what can you do to attract more attention? Um, it also looked like, um, and this became pretty big news, um, but things like during the general election, uh, Facebook and Google and Twitter sending their campaign staffers to work in Trump's offices of his digital operations in San Antonio. Um, these firms told me they also offered sort of the same level of support to the Hillary Clinton campaign, um, but the Democrats have been pretty good at digital for a while, and she felt like they had a really good, strong digital operation. They didn't really want people from Google and Facebook working in-house in their um, campaign offices. 
Uh, if you remember at the beginning of the general election, Trump didn't really have a campaign, um, so he didn't have that infrastructure. So when they offered to send um, some of their staffers to come work in his offices, where his digital offices were housed in San Antonio, they jumped at that. Um, and they were in the office, so side by side with the um, digital consultancies and the people that were working directly with the campaign. Um, and so, of course, this has big implications for uh, what ends up happening in, in the 2016 campaign. Um, so that's a little bit about what the tech firms get out of it. But I also want to talk about why do campaigns do this? They're doing it to try and get money, like Travis mentioned, and to, of course, try and get you to vote for them. Um, and they're getting it, they're using these platforms also to get more data back. So they're doing things, and, and I learned this from talking to people on the 2016 campaigns, you know, they're using all these different um, information that they can get back when they place posts to find out more information about you to have in their own data coffers so they don't have to keep going back to Facebook and Google to get more data about you. Um, so anytime you see ads like this that, that Travis showed earlier, before they decided on this ad, they've run thousands of iterations in this thing called A-B testing where they change tiny little things about the ads and they can find out, um, oh, these Porsche drivers who vote Republican often like it better when there's um, a gun in the ad and the Democrats like it better when there's a saw in the ad, right? Or these tiny little iterations. It sounds silly, but this is what they test. Um, at the height of the general election, folks on the Trump campaign told me that they were testing tens of thousands of iterations of ads a day on Facebook. And they were getting that data back almost in real time to be able to make these tiny changes that they hoped then would impact your thoughts about the Trump campaign or your thoughts potentially when you went to vote that day. Um, but I also found in talking to folks who worked on the campaigns that they're using uh, social media data. We think of this big data and, and it's computational, but they're also looking at this data in like really qualitative ways. So telling me, you know, um, people on the Cruz campaign said, remember when Donald Trump started insulting what uh, Ted Cruz's wife looked like? And so they were like, oh man, and they called this emergency meeting and folks in the Ted Cruz campaign are sitting around and trying to figure out how to respond to it and they start getting all these alerts on their phone. Well, Ted Cruz uh, apparently reads his replies a lot and so he was already on it and was just tweeting by himself. Um, and so the folks who worked on these campaigns told me that the the um, you know, congressmen and, and folks who are in office uh, often read the comments. I know, we say don't read the comments. They read the comments. And from that, they're saying, well, my constituents feel like this. We know it's not just their constituents, right? It's any of us can go comment on their Facebook pages or reply to them on Twitter. So they're taking these sort of uh, fuzzy readings from it as well. Um, of course, this is all, a lot of this has led to calls for uh, these firms to be a lot more transparent around these types of practices. Um, when I talk to folks in the industry about, for example, the Trump campaign having folks from these offices embedded in their campaign, within the political world, that did, no one thought that was a big deal. Uh, but once it became news, the reaction from the public and from the press made it clear that that was not something that most of us knew about. Um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of call for transparency around the content of the ads, and I think that's really important. Um, but I would also argue that we need a lot more transparency around what do these working relationships actually look like, um, so that we can understand really all that goes into that. Um, and I think that's all I'll say for now. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Emily Stewart. I'm a reporter at Vox. Um, so if you guys know Vox, we do like explainers. So today I'm going to explain a little bit about why I think that we cannot expect Facebook to police itself when it comes to things like Cambridge Analytica, Russian interference, data privacy, elections, fake news, and it's money. So let's go back. <laughs> I don't have like any cool graph. <laughs> this is kind of like the theme. Um, so if you remember, in July of this year, it's Facebook's quarterly earnings report. Publicly traded companies every three months have to say how things are going financially. Facebook reports their second quarter, 
and Wall Street freaks out. Facebook loses $120 billion in value in a single day. So like, what happened? Did Facebook lose all this money in the third quarter? Did Mark Zuckerberg go crazy? Nothing big happened at all. Um, its revenue was a little less than expected. It said that it was probably gonna be that way all year, and user growth was like kind of slow. But like, you look a little deeper, and part of what happened is that all the scandals that Facebook had been facing, Cambridge Analytica, Russian interference, was starting to take a toll. Like, remember how everybody was like, delete Facebook earlier this year? So it's like, some people did. Um, beyond that, in Europe, there was a new data protection law that lost Facebook some users. Um, it does a lot with data privacy. Basically, you might remember in May, you got like a slew of emails from companies being like, do you consent to us using your data? That was because of a law of Europe. Um, and it wasn't just Facebook that had this crazy reaction to its second quarter earnings. Twitter, when it reported earnings, lost a quarter of its value in a day. Um, and basically, why that happened was because the number of monthly active users on its platform declined. Um, leading up to that, Twitter had been purging a lot of fake accounts and bots from its platform. That's why engagement was less. So like, basically what I'm getting at is that Facebook and Twitter did like the minimal amount necessary to try and do something about fixing all of their issues. And Wall Street had a heart attack. So like, the thing about publicly traded companies is that there's this thing called shareholder primacy, where basically CEOs, boards of directors, have to put their investors first, or they do. They have since the 80s. Um, and what a lot of investors like about companies like Facebook and Twitter is that they have this whole move fast and break things, grow at all cost mentality. And any sign that they might abandon it, even just like a little bit, just be like a little bit better, makes investors nervous. That makes Facebook and Twitter nervous. So when you hear people talk about like Facebook and Twitter can just fix themselves, they're totally gonna like self-regulate, we'll just ask them what they need, you have to remember that there is not that much of an incentive for them to do that. Like that is why Facebook is constantly apologizing instead of like fixing what's wrong. They have made this business calculation that it's better to say they're sorry after they, after they do the bad thing and get caught instead of just not doing a bad thing in the first place. Um, Matt Iglesias, who I work for at Box, did a whole story this year listing out Mark Zuckerberg's apology starting at Harvard in 2003. And he's apologized a bunch since that too. Like this is what they do. Um, so when you talk about Russia using Facebook to buy ads, like rubles is still money. And fake news still gets people excited and engaged on Facebook. Or you look at Cambridge Analytica. Facebook makes money off of developers. It makes money off of people being on their platform. And for Twitter, like the bots suck and are annoying, but also like that increases engagement. That gets people there. Um, I also do want to take a second to point out that you hear a lot about conservatives saying that uh, Facebook and Twitter are biased against them. And I, I personally do not think that is the case. I think if anything, Facebook and Twitter sometimes bend over backwards to appease conservatives. In I think 2016, um, Facebook, there were some reports that Facebook was uh, suppressing conservative news and they had like a powwow with Republicans to be like, no, we're sorry, we're not doing this. Or like it took Facebook and Twitter forever to deal with Alex Jones, a right-wing conspiracy theorist who says that Sandy Hook was fake. And the guy who heads public policy at Facebook worked in the Bush White House, and he also supported Brett Kavanaugh. Um, Facebook is extra careful with conservatives because they want their money, they want progressives' money too. That is the point. Also, Facebook's audience, especially in the United States, is getting older, and older people, are, people tend to be more conservative, and so Facebook does not want to alienate anyone. Um, you know, they've talked about this before, but you are the product on Facebook. Um, sorry, I lost my place. So each user's data is worth about $200, $250 a year. Just your login is worth $5.20. And like, I'm not saying that this is an easy fix for Facebook or Twitter. It's like a big game of whack-a-mole. They fix one thing, they find another thing. Um, but I also think that we can't say, Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, Jack Dorsey, like they just want to save the world and there's nothing else going on here. Like there obviously is. They want money, they're businesses. So to put it a little bit more concretely, um, an example. So after 2016, a handful of senators proposed the Honest Ads Act, which was supposed to deal with like political advertising and transparency. Basically, you see like a political ad right now, you're seeing a million of them. And there's some guy always being like, I approve this message. On the internet, you don't have to do that necessarily. So the senators proposed this bill to say like we need more transparency. And then at the beginning of the year when there's all this controversy around Facebook and Twitter, um, 
Facebook and Twitter are like, hey, you know what? Like, we'll just do this ourselves. Like, you guys don't worry about it. Maybe you implement it, maybe you don't. But like, we also want to be better. So like, cut to this story. This is a couple of weeks ago. There are these ads being run in, Dem in um, Virginia about Jennifer Wexton calling her a Nazi, saying she's a liar. And we do not know who's running these ads. Facebook does. But like, you can put basically anything in the little box. And so these ads literally say, paid for by freedom-loving American citizen, exercising my natural law right, protected by the First Amendment and protected by the Second Amendment. Like, we don't know. There was a story in Vice today saying that like, they had made ads um, under Mike Pence's a name and like ISIS. So like, Facebook has not fixed this. Um, so if we accept that Facebook and Twitter are not going to like police themselves, right? Because it's hard because they don't like, like regulations. Like, so what is the other answer? Maybe you can say, okay, consumers. Okay, so you can all quit Facebook. But also, Facebook owns Instagram and it owns WhatsApp. So you have to quit all of that too. Um, and you know, quitting Twitter is hard, or even like Google, which I haven't talked about, but like Google knows so much about all of us and they run everything. So <laughs> then we have the government. And like I said, Europe has done some things. They have a new data privacy law. Germany has um, a hate speech law that's kind of interesting. But in the US, like, it's really hard. Um, one thing, Americans generally are not that into regulating business, especially tech, compared to Europe. And you can debate like, whether that's a good thing. There's a reason that companies like Facebook, Twitter, and Amazon are from the United States and not from abroad. But also, the idea that like, Twitter cannot figure out what to do with Alex Jones is obviously not ideal. Um, but I think the bigger issue is that US lawmakers literally have no idea what to do. Um, I'm about done. But I just want to bring up earlier this year when Mark Zuckerberg had to go to Capitol Hill to answer about Cambridge Analytica and data and Russian fake news. Basically, how these things work is like senators have five minutes to ask questions, and the next guy, the next guy, the next guy. So basically, I watched both days. It was very long and boring. But especially on the Senate side, what became increasingly clear was that senators had no idea what Facebook does, and they do not know how to fix it. So <laughs> Mitch McConnell, to be fair, was not there. <laughs> Some of the questions were good. Like Lindsey Graham asked if Facebook was a monopoly. Dick Durbin asked what hotel Zuckerberg was staying at, which seems kind of arbitrary, but he was making the point, like, you care about your privacy, why don't we care about ours? Amy Klobuchar asked about the Honest Ads Act. But some of the questions were super weird from Democrats and Republicans. Um, Bill Nelson wanted to know why he kept seeing chocolate ads on his Facebook. And I am not making these things up. Roy Blunt mentioned that his son likes Instagram and wanted to know if all of his Facebook friends were actually his friends. Brian Schatz, who is supposed to be good at the internet, and he is like good at Twitter, kept asking Zuckerberg whether Facebook could see the emails that he sends on WhatsApp. You do not send emails on WhatsApp. <laughs> so I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of problems, and I don't know how to fix them, but I don't think the government does either. But I think that when you hear companies say that they're going to fix themselves, or people say that companies can fix themselves, you have to understand that, like, no. <laughs> I mean, you talk about, like, so at the beginning I mentioned the one day where Facebook loses $120 billion. Zuckerberg has a lot of his money wrapped up in Facebook. That day, he lost $15 billion, just his own money. So, like, yeah, he's sorry because of Cambridge Analytica and your data and fake news. But he's also sorry because he lost $15 billion. That's it. So we have uh, about a half an hour or so for q and A. I'm going to put this over here in just a minute. Uh, let, maybe I'll start us off, though. I'm trying to sort out what the real issues are here. It seems clear to me, on the one hand, there's an issue with respect to privacy and protecting personal information and data and making sure it doesn't get divulged to people who shouldn't have it. There's another question about um, transparency of ads and the spread of false and fake news, false information and fake news, and knowing who pays for ads. Is there a problem with the practice of micro-targeting itself? It seems to me this is simply a more effective way of political advertising, to know who you want to get particular ads to. Is there a concern we should have about that practice? Is it problematic from a democratic standpoint? Does it 
increase polarization? I mean, or, or is it just a, a more effective way of campaign advertising? Whoever, whoever wants to answer that. Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So what, what is the problem with micro-targeting in itself? Um, maybe there aren't that many problems with it. Certainly the campaigns find it a more efficient use of their, their resources because they're not sending messages to the people they don't want to send messages to, and that's why it's so attractive to campaigns. But um, people do worry about kind of uh, the big picture things too. And if you're seeing ads about one thing, you're seeing ads about another thing, different issues, um, then after the election, you know, I think the result was about X. You know, there was clearly a mandate for Trump to do something about immigration because I only saw ads about immigration. It's like, wait, I didn't see those ads about immigration. I thought the election was about health care. And so that's a potential concern. There, there are concerns about polarization. This is a, a big question that we're trying to grapple with right now. To what extent does our, you know, being exposed to, uh, you know, maybe one side of the story on social media, does that further put us into our partisan camps? Uh, I think the jury is still out on that one, maybe. But others? Um, I think one of the other problems when we think about this is, you know, there's the uh, there's the practice of micro-targeting or the part of it that is like taking the information and putting the ads out there and, and the problems like you mentioned, but there's also the problem with the information that informs micro-targeting and I think that can be problematic as well. Um, so for example, if we're, uh, if campaigns and, and even these tech firms are taking about, you know, looking across their platforms and saying like, okay, these are conservatives talking about politics and these are liberals talking about politics. Well, do you think that's representative of all conservatives in the country or all liberals in the country? No, it's not, right? Most of us, like I'm a weirdo, right? Like I study politics and journalism, so I talk about this stuff a lot on the internet, but not everybody does. So when we look at, you know, when we take this information that we're gonna base micro-targeted ads on, on some of this sort of glean data that we can get from social media, we're getting a much more polarized and like shrunken version of the American polity than actually exists. And so so if campaigns make micro-targeting decisions based on this, then it, those ads look more polarized than they may get from you know, more representative data. So it sort of feeds into a loop, I think, is another problem um, from the sort of normative democratic standpoint that we can see. Actually, I'll make one more point then, which is I also worry about the people who drive Plymouths. In, in, in the sense that maybe no one wants to talk to them right? Um, you know, when they were watching TV and getting their ads through TV, people were, you know, the campaigns were talking to people who own Plymouth. Now they're ignoring them. And so that could have consequences as well. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm going to call on people. I'm going to ask you to keep your questions short. And I'm going to ask either the entire panel or individuals. I'm going to ask you to speak loudly. We don't have microphones. So, so yeah, right here. Um, is micro the advertising that uses micro targeting is that more likely or does that happen more often in primary elections or general elections? Or is there no difference? I'll talk a little bit about this. I think we see different versions of it, right? Um, so one of the things that in particular, if we look at micro-targeted ads that show up on social media, um, there's a lot of, uh, we all hear this term identity politics, and I can't tell if it's a bad word or not. Um, but we literally see different people's identities in these micro-targeted ads of, of me showing, you know, here, here I am, a liberal Democrat with the LGBTQ community, and this means that if you are like that, then you should vote for me, right? And, and so that's a version of within the primaries, we see different people, you know, in the conservative camp and the liberal tramp, 
uh, camp trying to carve out different sectors. And I think we see that in the primary a lot. Um, in the general election, it's a bit different. It's about trying to get the different segments of the people that you think will vote for you to actually turn out and vote for you. And so then the micro-targeting looks a little bit different because you're all going for the same person, but you know, I need to send a different message to the Plymouth driver than I need to send to the Porsche driver, even if I think they're both gonna, in the end, vote for the Republican in the general election. The messages that are gonna motivate them are gonna be different. And so that's how micro-targeting sort of comes in in the general election. So if we are, we're in a republic and we can directly affect policy changes in government and then the companies aren't going to regulate themselves and we're not going to stop using social media, how do we empower ourselves as users of that? Wait, sorry. Um, so I think part of it is just like being more informed. Like you can't, there's no way to like fix this, but like if you see a weird ad on Facebook or Twitter, or you see like a piece of news, like find a second source. Um, just like try and be like a more informed consumer of news and information. Um, and like, yeah, you can't, I mean, and also remember to vote on November 6th, everybody. <laughs> One response to that is that uh, these social media platforms do now have databases that you can search. So you can go online and you can put in someone's name and every ad in which that name appears um, will show up on your screen. So there, there have been some improvements in terms of transparency just in the past year. It was really just May of this year that I think Facebook and, and Google started putting that information online so we as, as citizens, consumers, could actually track it. Um. Yeah, and I think that's important, I mean, to get to Emily's point, so they did sort of the bare minimum, right? So, so Emily mentioned this a little bit, but so you can see the content of the ads, but you can't see who paid for them. So if you're wondering who's running this ad against me, or who's running this ad against you know the people in my district? You have no idea of no you have no way of knowing who that is. Um, the new requirements by Facebook. So one of the things that they did to try and be more transparent. I'm, I'm just going to use Facebook as the example because everyone's already beating up on them anyway. Um, so I'll just keep going. Um, so they, with the, after the Russian interference, they said, okay, well, we're gonna verify users who are US political users. So they literally mailed postcards to people's offices and you had to like say, I got this and, and put in a code to verify you are who you say you are if you're gonna put political ads. Now, how they define what's a political ad and what's not, that's a whole nother discussion we can have that's also problematic. Um, but but there's, you do have to put something in this box, like paid for by so-and-so, but there's no requirement that it be tied to anything related to who you actually are. Um, and so they've done this bare minimum, you know, to be able to say like, look, we're transparent, um, so that uh, people like uh, Senator Mark Warner and Amy Klobuchar won't be able to get enough momentum sort of going forward with their Honest Ads Act. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. You know, they haven't done that. And, and even when we think about micro-targeting, I think another practice that we can, that I think would be important is to see who were these ads targeted to? You know, who were the people that saw these types of ads? Um, ProPublica's uh, database is trying to get at that, but that's certainly not part of the transparency efforts so far coming out of places like Facebook and uh, Twitter and Google. Thank you guys for being 
here. Um, I, my question's for Emily specifically, um, just because you referred to um, how a lot of the senators who were questioning Mark Zuckerberg really had no idea what they were talking about. And I think of Orrin Hatch asking, how do you guys make money? Um, do you think, yeah, do you think um, if maybe we got some like fresh blood who are way, like way more in tune to social media and how the internet works, do you think that we could come up with more comprehensive policy changes? Good question. Um, I mean, maybe. I think also it, it like comes down to their staffers as well. Um, and like, I'm not sure if it's super more appealing to be working in like DC compared to Silicon Valley. There's also like a money issue there that I'm not sure. Like, if I were, if I knew a lot about this, I might want Silicon money. Um, but I mean, I think that there are people like if you look at Ro Khanna, he's in Congress. Um, he's from California. He's generally pretty good on this. Um, but also it comes down to also like the people he represents. It's a little bit funky. Um, but yeah, I think part of it is an age thing. I think it's also difficult. Um, but like Europe also sort of did a Q&A thing with um, Zuckerberg earlier this year and they were a lot better. Like they were just really good. But the format was also like he didn't have to answer any questions until the very end. So he didn't answer any questions. Um, <laughs> but. I mean, I think that there, yeah, there are like solutions, but a lot of it comes down to also like who is working for these lawmakers and getting in people who know about this stuff. I'll offer one thing that's not necessarily leg legislative, but but an answer. I think um, you know. I think Emily alluded to the ethos of like move fast and break things, and this is how it happens. Um, well, you know, the folks uh, who are working at all these companies, um, you know, are coming out of programs where they have not had humanities or liberal arts educations. They're coming out of so uh, you know computer science and computer engineering. So they don't think about these problems when they're building the algorithms and the platforms. These are like unintended consequences, like, oh, Facebook might have something to do with democracy, right? And so, um, you know, all of us are like, yeah, right? Like, yeah. of course, we're thinking about this. Um, so I think uh, this is a very long-term solution. Um, but I think, you know, we need to have folks who are getting computer science degrees and engineering degrees um, to also take some of these classes, like, in college while they're here um, so that they're thinking about these things as they're building the algorithms. Um, you know, uh, I saw just yesterday, um, you know, everyone at these Silicon Valley firms wants to tell us that, like, AI is going to be the answer to, to solving all these misinformation problems. Um, but I want to say two things about that. First of all, algorithms are programmed by humans, so let's not pretend that humans aren't part of that as well. Um, but like just yesterday, one of the trending topics on Twitter was, of course, uh, I think it was like hashtag bomb scare, and then the suggested other hashtags to follow were false flag and fake bombs. And these are the algorithmically suggested other things to follow. Um, if you have a, are a person who thinks about these implications, then you might have some built-in like fix for that, but right now we're just seeing it on the other side of it, not on the design of these different algorithms and platforms, which is where I think it actually needs to be. Maybe too late for some of them. I'm not sure. So I don't know if have, have any of you heard of, uh, and I can't say his last name, Anand, the G, and it starts with long. It's an Indian guy who wrote the book, Winner Take All. Anyway, it's, it's about the, the fact that Google and Facebook like to act like they're good people, but in fact they're deeply compromised by the amount of money they're making. And it seems to me that, you know, if you don't fix, you know, greed's a massive motive, right? And we're going to figure out ways to make ourselves look good and still make the money. But his point in the book, which is interesting, you should look at the, the stuff online about it, um, is that until you're willing to do something that's going to cost you real money, you probably aren't going to actually make the changes you need to make. And it seems like, you know, that the, I don't, I don't see how you, how you change this until you until people make those hard choices. Does that, does that make 
sense? Or? Well, I think it does, and I think these tech platforms could hire humans to approve every ad that goes on their platform. They, they, they don't. Um, it would cost a lot of money, right? And that's, that's getting to your point. lazy internet user. I, I browse things, I start to buy things, then give it up. I look at political ads and I just leave the window open. I want to be involved, I'm, I, but I'm, I, I'm just too lazy. But then I get these targeted ads for things. I get this targeted information and I like it. Oh yeah, I need to buy that thing on eBay. Oh yeah, I need to see this latest political ad from the political party or person I support. So I'm probably perfect for these people. But what should I be worried about here? You know, there's me, I'm responding to them, I'm looking at them. Should I care that they have all this information about me? Because at the moment, I don't. <laughs> I don't think you necessarily have to care, although I will say that sometimes I don't think these things work very well. I get lots of ads for shoes I've already bought, and I'm like, guys, I already bought these, right? Like, chill. <laughs> so I'm not sure that how great it even actually works sometimes. Um, but I do think the important thing, you know, should you be worried about it is just sort of like, like Emily mentioned, taking a minute and, and really glancing at these targeted ads that you might be getting. I think, first of all, even noticing if things are ads or not. On purpose, these companies have made it pretty hard to tell sometimes whether something is a sponsored post that you can see in like 0.8 font in uh, transparent gray at the very bottom of a post that otherwise looks completely normal. Um, so I'm adding more and more to our curriculum, but I also think that we need a digital media literacy course. Um, based on data from Pew, it actually appears that maybe my mom uh, needs it more. Um, they just had a study that shows that older Americans are actually worse at spotting um, fake news than our younger Americans. Um, so we need uh, a huge digital literacy push for all of us, not just those of us in college. <laughs> Some of it's like that your data is portable, so you can like download your data from like one platform and put it on another. Um, I think the right to be forgotten is in it, but I might be lying about that. So I would Google that afterwards. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to lie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, So I guess the question, who is a more desired customer or audience? Is it the, the people who are up for grabs in the middle or the people who are on one side or the other? And I'm not sure I have a, a good answer for that. My sense is that a lot of those dollars that Facebook is, is getting on political ads is for things like judicial races or for county commissioner because they're not gonna buy ads on TV. They don't have enough money. So they're doing almost all of their advertising on digital. And in those instances, frankly, they aren't tailoring their ads to have 20 different options. It's, it's the one, you know, you live in this geography, I want you to see that ad. And so I think there is a lot of value in those people who may be in the middle, who just happen to live in a place um, where their vote is needed. But. I think it sort of depends what the campaign wants. Um, so, I mean, of course, the, ultimately, at the end, they want your vote. Um, but we also know from decades of research, it's really hard to persuade people to change their mind. Um, so they also want your money, right? The campaigns want you to donate money. And so that's more the partisan end, right? That's more the people who we know are, 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 the, are the Porsche drivers or the Subaru drivers, right? They're getting a lot of targeted ads that, that they know they're going to be able to collect money from these folks uh, 
donations, maybe even volunteer uh, hours as well. And that's one of the ends, right, that campaigns are going for. Um, ultimately, in the end, of course, they want you to get out to vote, and that's going to have to be the people in the middle as well. Um, but that's going to happen closer to election day. Usually, that those types of targets, you know, uh, in the lead up to it, it's it's money it is what they're going for. I mean, I think that's a, like. That's like the big question. And I think also the question is like whether US antitrust laws are actually equipped to deal with tech companies. Like the way that they're sort of designed now is like the big question is are they making consumers spend more or less money? And so that's sort of how our antitrust laws are being interpreted right now. And so like is Facebook a monopoly? Like should it have been allowed to buy Instagram? Like maybe not, right? But our antitrust laws, at least in the United States, are not really equipped to handle companies like Google or Facebook because they are just so broad that like they don't know what to do. And also just like our antitrust laws are not that well enforced. Like we're allowing a ton of vertical mergers and this is bad. Yes. <laughs> And it's not just and it's not just on Facebook, right? If you search something on Google and then you open Facebook, you're going to get suggested ads based on what you were searching on Google, right? And and so it's not even just within platforms; it's across. Um, they don't like to share stuff, right? They're all trying to make more money than one another. But what they do buy from each other are data, right? So Facebook is buying data from Google, and Google's buying data from Facebook. Um, so yes, when you're signing up, uh, anything that's on there. I mean, you know, I don't know. I joined Facebook like when you still had to have like a .edu account, and so Facebook still has the data about like whatever music I liked when I was 22 years old, which may or may not matter anymore, right? But that stuff is is there forever, and, and they're making decisions about how useful that is or not uh, as something that they might want to sell to advertisers. Oh, the question, sorry, I just said yes very dramatically. Um, the question was, uh, when I'm signing up for Facebook, uh, are they just, am I signing over my data? And that was my emphatic yes, <laughs> you are, basically, or, or any of these other sort of sites that you're on. Yeah. Yes, it's legal. Yes, it's legal. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sort of what you brought up in the very beginning, uh, it's free. And so, but that's, I guess it doesn't have to be that way, right? I mean, some of the regulation that we've seen coming out of the European Union is, is putting some regulation around this. Um, I'm not particularly optimistic that that's anything like that is going to happen in the U.S. I don't know your guys' take on that, but... help us protect us from, the, from this data mining. What is, what's doomsday? What's the worst case scenario that, that comes out of it if we, if we can leave Facebook and all these other companies, Google, unregulated? Um, this is a big question. It's a great question. Uh, um, the, yeah, the question is, what, what is the doomsday scenario if this continues? Um, unabated, picks up force, and I think um, let continued and more, or less trust in the news media, inability to separate fact from fiction. Um, I, I have a lot of worries about the news media. If, if this, you know, if the spread of false information continues, if anyone and everyone can buy ads to counter what anyone and everyone is saying, and you know, and we can we can regulate the political advertising if it says vote for something, but when it comes to the spread of false information, well, that's protected by the First Amendment, right? And you know, the face or the technology companies, I guess, could step in and decide that they want to do it for the goodness of democracy, but. There's really nothing government can do to regulate it. So th those are some things that come to mind. Um. 
I think the First Amendment quite, like point is an important one. Like you hear a lot of people talking about like Twitter is infringing on my First Amendment rights. So like a Twitter does not owe you the First Amendment. That's only the government, and there's confusion about that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's also a question of like how much do you want like all like your data to be out there. I mean, it's already out there. Right? Facebook lost a bunch of people's data a few weeks ago. But I think that that is a thing sometimes we think about as well. And part of the reason I think that we get so upset about our data on Facebook is that people are more aware of what they gave to Facebook. Like, I decided to upload my pictures. I decided to like chat on their, their messenger or whatever. And so I think like that's an important thing to keep in mind just in general. Um, but I mean, the data stuff is really hard. Like all of our stuff's probably on the dark web. What do you know about Doomsday? So I don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think when you see a political ad, you should know who's sending you that message. Like there, again, like when you see all these, like a million different ads right now on television, at the end, every single one, it's like, I am whoever and I approve this message. Like, because that helps you figure out like why that person is sending you that message, what their motivations are. So like, yeah, I think that that makes sense to know like who is sending you a message because then that helps you also understand like their reasons for doing so. I think uh, I think that's a really important point. The idea I can't tell if I'm like talking way too much into this or not. Um, I, the idea that platforms like Facebook and Google are sort of these private companies, but operating as basically public utilities and, and infrastructures for our daily sociality and, and political um, actions. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting, and we haven't talked about this blatantly today, but Facebook and Google and Twitter do not want to be media companies. They are media companies, right? And, and, we, and you're talking about the tensions between privately owned for-profit business and democratic values. We have that. That's what the press is, right? But we have imbibed in the press this you know, importance of the fourth estate and, and of journalism and democracy. And does it always work perfectly? No, right? But there is this sort of ethos of the importance of that that serves as a kind of corrective on sometimes um, the profit-seeking motives, of course, of news companies. Um, I think the first step to getting any of these technology firms to act that way is to get them to admit and act a bit like media companies. Um, I actually, this is one thing that I do feel a tiny bit optimistic about um, because they are increasingly having, uh, you know, admitting to having like editorial staffs and that their decisions are editorial. And so this is the one part of all of this uh, doomsday apocalypse that I'm feeling a little bit optimistic about is that I think they're getting closer to admitting that they're media companies. And if they admit that they're media companies, then we might be able to bring some of these same values that we've had for so long um, in the press sort of into that. And, and that may serve as a bit of a corrective. Probably not enough, but a little bit. I just 
wondered, what's the fraction? So the digital data that we're talking about right now, there's a huge amount of stuff like credit card use, and phone use, and whatever. So what fraction of all commercial data that somebody can buy that have money is Facebook data and Google data? I don't, I don't know what percentage it is, but if we're talking about value, what is the greatest value is tying all those things together, right? So tying your consumer behavior, identifying you as like a row in data and adding more and more columns to it, right? So your Facebook likes, your Google searches, the cars you buy, the party you're registered with, um, who you date, you know, like all of these are data points. And so the value comes from being able to merge more and more of them together. Um, so I, I don't know the share, but the added value of having the things that we share informally and socially with our friends and family, in addition to consumer data, in addition to the data that the government has, you know, based on all the different places that we registered, that's the value of it is tying in um, this really personal data to this other sort of like consumer data and, and other voter file data. So I don't know the percentage, but I know that it's really valuable when you can tie it into all this other data. Thank <laughs> you.